Uh, I'm your host, Chris Pinto. With me tonight, the Belly Up Fantasy crew, guys. We got Houston, Ryan, Tom, and Zach. Man, how are y'all doing tonight, gentlemen? We got a lot to talk about tonight. How are y'all doing? All good. A little hot. A little hot. Why is that? Yeah, it's, what, 110 degrees here in Texas? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Effing crazy, man. Zach, how are you doing down there, baby? I'm doing well, man. Did you hear about Did you hear about the NHL? Uh, I heard you say something about it, but I want you to tell me about it. Oh, uh, yeah, just hours ago, boys and girls. They, they voted. They approved. <laughs> yeah, fancy returning to play they, they did a return to play and a cba so you know two birds one stone uh whatever cliche you want to throw at that but uh we're returning to play saturday august 1st there should be like a million games every day i can't wait man that sounds fun i know you're hyped up about that houston what are you doing up there in the dakotas baby not a whole lot it's good to be back you know fourth of july weekend last week and i had to get off but I'm glad to be back, talk about some running back uh, by committee, some split backfields tonight. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, we're going to be talking about some timeshares, and I'm not talking about the kind that you sell, baby. What's going on <laughs> in Philly? Yeah, I ain't selling any timeshares. I don't know about all that. <laughs> we're, we're dealing with a little tropical storm action off the coast here. It's, uh, it's a, little, a little wild outside, but got to make do. Man, well, I'm – Glad to be here with you guys. I missed y'all over the week. I'm glad we do this every Friday. Um, everyone who's listening and supporting us at home, watching us on Facebook and Twitter, we really appreciate it, man. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, please go follow the rest of the Belly Up Fantasy, or I'm sorry, the rest of the Belly Up Sports Talk lineup. We've got some great shows. Go follow Belly Up Podcast Network as well. Um, we've got the Quarter Booth podcast. We got a round for the weekend. Ryan had a great show, a good unboxing tonight. It was really fun. Always uh, debuts a new beer. Um, last minute of play and uh, a world without sports. The hard court honeys as well. Don't forget about them. Don't sleep on them. They're amazing. And then our own Zach Mack um, has his own podcast. They're taking a little hiatus right now, but they will come back stronger than ever. I don't doubt that. Use the hashtag bus, guys. B U S T. Find out what you're missing. Um, guys, tonight we've got a cool guest. It's more of a out of the fantasy football community. We've been talking about how great the fantasy football community has been, uh, but our guest tonight is going to be a little bit different. He's more of a celebrity. Uh, in my mind, if y'all like reality TV like me, it's my like guilty pleasure. I love reality TV, all sorts of reality TV. I'm talking Survivor to uh love island the uk that i talk about with our guys from the rider bowl all day me and matt talk about season three curious and Kemp a little bit leave it all day but this guy that's coming on is a genuine guy great guy fun uh texas native like ryan and i and also aggie native uh like ryan and i we got cliff hogg joining us he's going to teach us how to pivot guys which is a huge thing in the fancy football world um Houston, before we jump in with our guest, let's let's kick it off a little this or that, man. I'm excited about this. I love that. Actually, Cliff is here. Let's get him on and get him talking. Let's go, Cliff Hog, baby. <laughs> hey, Cliff, guys. Hey, I love the hat. Let me intro you in real quick. I didn't know you were in. This, everybody who is joining us, is William Clifford Hogg III from Big Brother 21. This guy will teach you how to pivot like nobody else. We're talking, if y'all know what Big Brother is, he was voted out on the first night by Mickey. He won, came back into the house, got voted out, got evicted week three, and then came back into the house yet again, making the top four. This guy's an Aggie engineer. A great guy, super fun guy to talk to. I was just blown away, starstruck, if you would, Cliff, when you messaged me back. Um, top well, four in Big Brother 21, Aggie, Texan, Cliff, how are you doing tonight, sir? Oh, also a fancy football champion. Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. And it's amazing. There's actually people who do fantasy leagues for Big Brother TV. And to think that people were picking me just like we picked guys on fantasy football, that, that was kind of cool. It was a neat idea. So uh, I've told a lot of people that, well, I hope you profited by picking me. I'm sure I was one of the, the later draft picks. So, <laughs> Cliff, I would pick you 1.01 in my pick, sir. Oh, Love all right. Thank you. 
Uh, you did the money Manzel all day in the in the different. Yes, there we go. Cliff, let our listeners know a little bit about yourself because I'm a fan boy, so I know a lot about you. But some of our listeners who are just strictly fancy football related, let them know who you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Cliff Hogg. I, I've been a reality fan forever, but that's not been my life. I, I've got an engineering degree. I've worked in the oil field my entire life. Uh, just through a weird. Oh. Weird chain of events. I managed to get on Big Brother last summer, and uh, I, I, first time I ever tried out, I just showed up at a casting call and talked away. And next thing you know, I'm sitting there spending three months in a house with a bunch of people, cameras on 24 hours a day, and uh, and uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun. It, it was quite the experience. I spent a lot of time while I was in there just asking the people, saying, "Can't you just tell me how my Aggies are doing? Let me know how my Astros are doing." I'm a, I'm a big sports guy, and I missed all the last summer because of it, and, and the early part of the fall. So that was tough. That was not easy. But I can so imagine why, so. Why, what, was your, <laughs> what was your most memorable? Ex- oh, is that Dr. Pepper? Uh, yeah, I've got to have my Dr. Pepper with me. <laughs> <laughs> what was your most memorable experience in the Big Brother house? Well, I gotta say two. Uh, first of all, those first five ten minutes when I walked into the house. I've watched this show forever and to actually be inside and have the cameras on me and think, what the hell did I just get myself into that you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are suddenly watching me do good or bad or whatever. So that was certainly memorable that first five minutes. But I think overall, the biggest part was probably on day 30. I got blindsided, voted out of the house. Christy. Uh, Oh, it was high out there. I was so upset with them and they voted me out of the house, but I fought my way back in. I only one person got back in and I won that competition, got back in. And just a few hours later, I won the the HOH competition with which put me in charge and I got to put people on the block and kind of be the king of the house for the next week. So that was an amazing five or six hours. It was uh it was quite the turnaround. I remember that my wife tweeted out it had to be an Aggie engineer to win that competition. Uh, you were on there and you were just moving that ball so good. It was crazy. Your hands were steady. It was amazing. I, I'm a kid of the 70s and, and the 80s. So video game, yeah, you know, the pinball machines and playing the game, the arcades and all that. I, I know I had to do that stuff. So, so I had a little bit of an edge, I think, on that competition. You might have. You might have, Cliff. Let's get into some more some fantasy football stuff that I didn't know about you because I had to ask you these questions as well. Um, I had to ask you if you've ever played fantasy football and what your experiences was. And then obviously you told me, hey, I'm a previous champion. So, you know, you you you've got you know, you got a trophy in your own right. Um, what, maybe, what, maybe a tiny little trophy, but uh, hey, yeah, a trophy is a trophy, sir. <laughs> yeah, my background, I uh grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So I grew up a Cowboys fan, but once I got down to Houston, I really got into the Houston sports and, and unfortunately then the Oilers left, but I didn't have my local team to cheer on. And that's really when I jumped in on fantasy football, playing, playing the fantasy sports since I didn't have a home team there for, for quite a few years. And uh, I've always, always played a lot. Pros is primarily, I do some college stuff with, with family members and all of that, but uh, uh, I've always played and, you know, I, I think I've done all right. I've I haven't won every season I played, but I've won a couple of seasons. So, <laughs> so tell us about your most memorable moment in fantasy football, and then also tell us when you won. Who was your star player? Who? Yeah. Who all right. Well, I, I'll give you. I can't give you one moment. I just I've got a couple of moments. Seems like a few of those Monday night games where where you're sitting there knowing that you're either just a couple of points ahead or a couple of points behind, and I've had one or two where the game was already out of hand. It was just a matter, you know, that last drive, are they going to pick up some trash points? Get me. <laughs> I've played in a lot of uh, PPR type leagues. So, you know, every catch is an extra point. And you just see those things racking up. And I know I had one where uh, I think Jameis Winston, he fumbled at the end and it cost the other team two points, which was enough to put me ahead. And yeah, it's funny when you just sit here and you do your little dance and you're cheering just because the other team had some boneheaded little move. But, the season I probably remember the best and the one I had most fun with, you got to go way back because this was with Marshall Falk. He was my my stud for that particular season. So that was, what, late 90s, I think. But uh, normally I play very conservative. I look for the consistent players that may not be the, the top scoring every week, but they 
they're less injury prone. They just have the nice steady output. But this particular season, I thought I saw something in Falk and the draft position was such that I traded away some QBs and some RB as a, and some uh, receivers and everything to get Falk. And I rode that guy the entire season. Every single game, he was he was doubling the output of the whole rest of my team combined. So as Marshall Falk and then whoever I could pick up on waiver wires and backups to replace injured folks. And so it was really, it was the most strategic season I ever played, even though I just had the one guy I could count on as long as he stayed healthy. But it was all of the rest of the team just to get those extra bit of points. And I know at the very end when I won the championship, the other guy complained, said, oh, you didn't do anything. You just had one stud player. I said, yeah, but I had to work all season long to, to back that guy up. So. Yeah, being able to pivot and work that waiver wire is key and crucial. And then also, I mean, in fantasy football, having that gut inclination about a player and then it paying off, how yeah. how great is that feeling? Oh, it's amazing. And just, I remember that season, lots of little things. I didn't have much of a QB, so I was having to pick up backups to QBs that look like maybe they were injured or in trouble. And suddenly you read on the wire that they're getting replaced or they're on the injured reserve. And suddenly you got a guy who's going to be starting the next, the next weekend he's playing Cleveland or so on. And you're like, all right, now I'm in a better position than I used to be. (laughs) That's awesome. Cliff. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I feel like I play fantasy football. And the reason I enjoy fantasy football is the same way that I, I enjoy big brother. It's all that strategy. It's the idea of step by step. What can you do differently today to, to improve your position and catch other people off guard that maybe do something they aren't quite expecting and and things like that. I like one of your quotes from big brother. I was looking you up the other day and your quote, I think it said, uh, my strategy is to come in and have everyone think I'm a soldier. And at the end, turn on them all. That's (laughs) that's ruthless cliff. I love it. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's right. You you can't be too, you can't be too uh, predictable. You've got to surprise people here and there, but, uh, yeah, the biggest thing in Big Brother, just like Fancy, it's all about the, the adaptability. Uh, I went in knowing that, that things weren't always going to go my way and I was going to have to to make some shifts and some changes as I went through the process. And that served me well in the game. Of course, now the tough part is I was in Big Brother all last summer, so I missed all my sports into the, the last part of the summer. I missed half of the football season, so... I really wasn't so caught up in football, college or pro, either one, because just I was busy with other things. So I really was looking forward to this fall as being the difference maker. And now I'm still just keeping my fingers crossed that we actually get some seasons and I don't spend another fall with nothing to do except watch goofy, you know, other sports on TV. (laughs) Cricket, things like that. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Formula One, rodeo. I got a few sports I'm watching, but it doesn't compare to college and pro football. I'll just leave it at that. Absolutely not, Cliff. Absolutely not. Cliff, I don't want to keep you too long here. I know you're a busy guy. Can you tell our followers um, where they can follow you, what they can look for? Um, I know you're an engineer by by profession, but are you working on anything right now? Well, we see you on Celebrity Big Brother one day. Oh, hey, that works for me. All I got to do is make the call and I'm good to go. I'd love to try it again. Uh, along with Survivor, Amazing Race. I, I always like proving people wrong. And part of it, I'm 54 or 55 years old now. And so I know when I went in the house, there were a lot of people said, oh, he's the old guy. He'll never do anything. So I love proving people wrong in a lot of different environments, including reality shows. But, uh, now, oil field's doing not so great right now. So I'm, I'm fighting through uh, – uh, the oil field and trying to, to survive in that particular industry, which is, is challenging at the moment. But having said that, yeah, I did, certainly y'all can find me a couple of places. Uh, Cliff.hog uh, on Twitter, uh, Cliff underscore or Cliff.hog on Instagram, Cliff underscore hog on uh, Twitter. Uh, but I'm also, for those of y'all familiar with the TV Co app, I do a show once a week, Monday nights, uh, eight o'clock or seven o'clock East uh, Central Time. Uh, called Cliff Notes. And, and I just sit there and I tell stories, talk about my travels around the world and my big brother experiences and things like that. Cliff, thank you so much for coming on with us and, you know, just taking the time out of your day. I know you're a busy guy and I know a lot of people want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> also, everyone who's watching, Cliff will also be a part of our St. Jude's Belly Up Bowl, our first annual Belly Up Bowl. Yeah, thank you so much, Cliff. Uh, for I'm looking forward to it. 
Uh, we'll uh, we'll see what league you get in, and hopefully uh, you draft well, sir. I hope so. I <laughs> I've had I've had too many players. I've depended on people like I don't Stafford, Eli Manning, and you know again I I don't always have the flashy folks, but uh, I like to think I'll surprise a few people in this league as well. So we'll see what happens. Maybe this year you get a top three pick and you take Patrick Mahomes or something like that, Texas boy. Hey, <laughs> that will. Hey, he's eight. The kind of contract he signed, I wish a uh, li- little more value than I had in the Big Brother house. I'll just put it. <laughs> I mean, you were voted in the top three for viewer favorites, Cliff. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. kind of good being the, I mean, like you said, you were the oldest person in the household. So, I mean, half off to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. It, it was a lot of fun, but now I'm back to the real world. And I hope to God that includes include some football this fall. That's all. Just keep those fingers crossed. Yes, sir. Cliff Hogg, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. You have a great weekend, sir. I absolutely will. Cheers, guys. I look forward to y'all. Uh, talk to y'all again later and uh, holding up that trophy at the end of the season. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Y'all take it easy, guys. You too, man. Yes, sir. Everyone who is watching, that was Cliff Hogg with us from Big Brother 21. Uh, Great guy, friend of the show. I cannot say more nice things about him. Houston, we're going to take a pause on the this or that, though. Let's jump right into what we've been talking about. Yeah, let's do it. We we want to have a show today. We're going to talk about backfields and split backfields, timeshares, obviously. We're going to kick off the show with one of the most electrifying offenses on paper right now. We talked about them last week on our pod, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Ryan, we talked about them a little bit in general, but let's break down their running backs this week. They've got Keyshawn Vaughn, a rookie out of Vanderbilt University. Go Commodores, hashtag SEC, it means more. And then they've got Rojo, too. Um Early projections on these guys. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Early projections on these guys have Keyshawn Vaughn ahead of Rojo too. I don't know if that's the case. Um, just because I want you guys to tell me that I am not being stupid, thinking Keyshawn Vaughn will outscore Rojo too. Um, Byron Leftwich has, you know, like I mentioned last week, he's only called 25 games for this team. Um, or in total in the NFL, I'm sorry. And he has leaned on the pass more than the run, but for some reason in the red zone, he looks to the run versus the pass. So what does this mean for both these guys? Keyshawn Vaughn was an athlete at Vanderbilt. Uh, He trusted the process. He grew in that role at Vanderbilt. But Rojo, he's not some guy that you can just throw to the wayside either. He had great numbers last year. Ryan, what do you have on these guys, and who should I be looking at? Because their current ADPs are, you know, not that far off. Keyshawn Bonds at 17, roughly, and then Rojo's at 19. Yeah, this is a tricky backfield. Um, I can't remember which one of you guys was mentioning it. I think it might have been you, Houston, that or Tom, that Arians does not like playing rookies very much. And that has got me thinking that if I'm going to get exposure to one of these guys, I'm going to get exposure to uh, Jones rather than Vaughn. When you look at like their collegiate careers, I prefer Jones to Vaughn. However, you look at Vanderbilt, they got to play a bunch of tough defenses and they're not all that good. So what he was able to do when he was there is pretty impressive. Uh, The other thing is, I just don't know. I know with Leftwich, but how much of that offense do you think is going to be Leftwich and how much is going to be Brady? Like how much is Brady going to be taking control of the reins there? Uh, which is why I'm not 100% sure I want either of these guys early. Uh, I'd like exposure to either one of them if the price is right because, I mean, what, they're one injury away from being a really good back. Either one of them in that offense could be a good fantasy back. Let me rephrase that. But – See, I didn't get the whole Vaughn over Jones thing either because my initial rankings had Jones slightly higher. But when I look at all the other guys looking at their rankings, everybody seems to lean a little bit towards Vaughn. Um, when I'm looking at like Mike Clay has him 31 and he has Jones 33. Like that is very close. We're splitting hairs here. 
So if you're going to be getting any one of these guys, they need to be your RB2 at best, probably your RB3 slash flex guy, because I'm not 100% sure if they both stay healthy, that either one of them are going to give you the kind of production you need to be starting on a weekly basis, especially considering the amount of other offensive weapons that are on that field. Uh, it's just going to be – plus, <laughs> Tom Brady is really good at and ones, third and one, fourth and one. I always expect Brady to possibly sneak that sucker in. He's so good at it. I just don't know if either one of those guys are going to be the red zone guy. Uh, their their projections look very similar. I think this is a tough backfield as far as which one of those guys is going to win. So I'm tending to lean Ronald Jones just because of Arian's past uh, aversion to playing rookies that much. I mean, <laughs> this one's a tough one, guys. And what do you all think? I'm, I'm going to piggyback off of you. I I, I have this, this feeling that, that the reason Tom Brady went to Tampa is because He's sick of he was sick of playing the team or whoever team it was in in New England. He wants to throw the ball down the field. Bruce Arians is going to let him throw the ball down the field. I think he wants to prove to everyone that he can he can be the not check down quarterback. And he's sick of hearing people talking about him as a check down quarterback. So I think we're going to see Tom Brady throw the ball down. Whether or not he's successful at it, I, I'll leave that to you guys. But I think he's going to throw the ball down the field, which is why I I'm very much behind you. I don't. I don't know that I'm high on either of these running backs, and I would give the edge to Jones just because he's not a rookie. So we talked about this last week. I mean, Chris, I'm sure you remember my short answer when you asked which running back I'm taking is either. I really don't like either. As a flex option, maybe I could get behind one of them. I think early season, it's it's Ronald Jones. But personally, I think by week five, six – I think you're going to see Keyshawn Vaughn's ability to catch the ball really start having an effect on on his uh, his downs, you know, play. He's going to be out there a lot more, whether it be in the backfield or he might find his way into the slot. I mean, you know, they aren't super deep at receiver beyond Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. You, know, you have some okay guys, but if he has the ability to catch the ball, why not throw him out there? Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that. Um, I really do think Rojo is going to be the guy that starts, but like y'all were saying, Keyshawn Vaughn probably comes in. I mean, he had a pretty good two seasons at Vanderbilt, 170 yards and 270 yards, two touchdowns, one touchdown in the reception game. So I think that works out for Keyshawn Vaughn as long as he can block. And that's going to be a big deal because Brady's not going to allow a running back that's not going to block. And and it, or the O-line, correct. Uh, but we also saw what Brady did with James White. Could Keyshawn Vaughn be the next James White, or is it going to be Dar Dare Agumba Wale? Who knows? Five times. Yeah, exactly. So if if that happens, I don't know. I I think I would lean Vaughn towards the end of the season, just because you're going to win your championship after the normal stuff. But we'll move on because we're going to push forward on this. Houston. As I've said from the beginning, man, you and Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, you broke that before anything could happen, and you were like, the Chiefs are going to get him. Six hours later, Patrick Mahomes is sending a text to C or to Clyde Edwards saying, let's go. Uh, between him and Damian Williams, though, where are you taking these guys? Clyde Edwards is at ADP around 11. Damian Williams almost to 40. Damian Williams also is, probably could have been a Super Bowl MVP. Sure. Uh, he's not a scrub. Uh, I've got them very close in my projections with CEH taking over the lead. Um, how do you feel about these two guys? Yeah, and I uh, I pull my ADP data from 444.com, and currently they have Clyde Edwards as the RB18 uh, going in the third or fourth round, and uh, Damian Williams as RB31 going in the eighth to ninth round. I just felt that Clyde Edwards Hilaire pre draft was a good fit for the Chiefs. And you know, it's the Chiefs, they're going to go out and do something surprising because you got a generational talent and Jonathan Taylor sitting there. And you'd rather take the pass catching back at Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who saw 55 catches in a college offense. I mean, yeah, he had Joe Burrow throwing the ball. And I love Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator um, now in Carolina. But to produce a college running back that's going to catch the ball out of the backfield, one, the college running back has to have have talent and he's got to know how to uh, work in that scheme. And that's the same scheme he's going to see in Kansas city. 
Uh, it's crazy that on a talent uh, standpoint that Damian Williams is fantasy relevant because he's not that talented as a running back. But when you play with Patrick Mahomes in the best – best scoring offense in the NFL, it makes you relevant. It makes you a a good running back. Last year, going into 2019, Damian Williams was super overhyped. He was going in the second and third rounds in many fantasy drafts. Um, I actually got one share of him, and I knew as soon as I took it, I was like, "Ah, I should not have did this. Because then we saw LaShawn McCoy go to KC. But... You know, uh, the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs has came out and said that they still want to get Damon Williams involved. He's going to be the lead back. That's all bluff. I mean, they have pe- they have missing pieces on defense, and then you go and you take your first-round pick on a running back. I mean, he's going to play. It might not be the first week or the second week, but look at Kareem Hunt as a rookie in Kansas City. He was dominant. He was a top-five fantasy back as a – Rookie and Clyde Edwards Hilaire, he's going to get 11 to, I think, maybe 14 opportunities a game. And when you play in this offense, that's really all you need. I mean, so the, uh, Clyde Edwards goes to the RB18. I'm willing to take him, you know, probably in, in the back half of the second round this year. I think he's going to be the best uh, rookie running back this year. Damian Williams going in the eighth and ninth. I personally don't want to touch him just because it's not worth it to me. There's no upside. Yeah, he might have a good three, four, uh, first three, four weeks. He might be really good, but I'm not, I don't want to take that eighth or ninth round. I'm looking at other positions like wide receiver, tight end, or maybe my first quarterback. So I'm not going to touch him there, but yeah, give me Clyde in the second round. I really like that. If he drops more to the third or fourth, that's where the value is going to come because if you take him, if you're taking him in the second round, the value goes down, of course, because he might not produce as well as those other guys in that range. But I really like Clyde, and I think he fits in this offense really well. That's fair. I mean, I've got Clyde Edwards Hilaire projected at 150 carries, six touchdowns, 330 yards, and two touchdowns. So that's pretty big business over there in Kansas City when we know that they're going to throw the ball a lot. Um, I, I'm with you on this for CEH being the guy to own in Kansas City. Uh, I don't think anyone else would say otherwise really at this point. Um, My only t- argument would be Williams does take a little bit off of what his potential could be without Williams being there. And also the fact that they have Darwin Thompson, they signed DeAndre Washington, and Daryl Williams might be their goal line back. There's just a lot of people there. I mean, CH is going to be the going to get the most touches out of all those guys. I don't think any of us really are thinking. Or does anybody think otherwise? I think he's going to get the most touches, so he is definitely the safest pick out of that backfield. I just think there's a lot of mouths to feed in that offense. But I, at first, I was like, man, he was with Joe Burrow. I'm like, well, now he's with Patrick Mahomes. Like, what? what what am I doing here? This is a more talented quarterback he's going to with an even more high-powered offense. He's going to get the most touches. He's going to get the most fantasy points. Uh, the question is how much are those other guys going to eat into his production? I'm not thinking to, too much. I just wonder how many people thought he would – like coming out of LSU, how many people were going to say, yeah, he's going to go to a more powerful offense with a better quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Houston was one of them. But – it's there are not many places you can go that it gets better than LSU in 2019 right. with Joe Burrow. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, he's lucky. <laughs> Man, right. uh, I want to give a couple shout outs to our people in our live chat right now. Scott Davis, John King, Billy Witt of Belly Up Sports. Thank you guys for commenting right now. Um, also, I know one of our original listeners is listening right now, but he's on a pier. It's his 33rd birthday. It's Michael Lowe and Courtney Leanne. They're in Rockport, Texas this weekend celebrating Michael's 33rd birthday. So catch some fish, Michael. Go eat a boiling pot. Drink a whole bunch of beer, uh, and we'll see you later, man. Uh, there's going to be a lot of smack talking going on, Reese, uh, pretty coming up. We're a bunch – or a bunch of us are in a bunch of different leagues together. Uh, we're going to start a belly up league here pretty soon. I'm hoping I wanted to talk to Houston about this, about doing a live draft. 
where we can just talk smack to each other because smack talking is so much fun in fantasy football. And there's not a better way to commemorate your league winner uh, than using trophy smack. There is not a company or business that does it better than them. They create trophies, belts of all sizes, and also rings in a variety of colors with free engraving and free shipping. And now we can do a free ring with a purchase of a trophy or belt if you use the promo code belly up guys click on our link go to our twitter or facebook and use the trophy code belly up go to trophysmack.com and use our promo code today to get a ring for free for your league trophy smack is great guys um zach mac baby we've talked about these guys constantly with you because i because you're you're a fan of them the detroit lions man they had a guy carry on my wayward son that we all thought was going to be the guy. He was not the guy. They drafted a guy from the SEC. Go Dogs, University of Georgia. It just means more in the SEC. DeAndre Swift had a, you know what I'm saying? He's just Swift. He's elusive. He's going to be the guy. I hope he's going to be the guy. Uh, what 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 are your thoughts on your hometown favorite team backfield? So, yeah, two SEC guys back there. you got to be loving that. Uh, <clears throat> as a fan, first off, before we get to fantasy-wise, not fantasy-wise, best backfield of my life that I've, I've been able to like, and we, and we don't even know if we're going to get a season yet. But anyways, the point is I'm excited as a fan because I, like, I, didn't, I didn't live through Barry Sanders. So this is, this is the best backfield that we're about to get. And um, as far as NDP goes, uh, it's – I get mine off of uh, Fantasy Pros, and I think it was Carryon Johnson at 78 and DeAndre Swift at 75 uh, on standard. So very close. But when you look at PPR, uh, DeAndre Swift's up to 61, and uh, Carryon Johnson drops to 99. So as far as most people are concerned, the catches are going to go to DeAndre Swift, which I think he's going to spread out the field anyways. That's I think that's the reason they drafted him is so – that Detroit, I mean, they got Bevel as OC. It was his first year last year, but we all know Stafford only played seven or eight games. Didn't get to showcase their their offensive talent the entire year. So it's really like, here we are. We're back to square one. We're going to try again. And I say this over and over again on this show. I don't draft Detroit players, all right? So as far as I'm concerned, I'm staying away from these two guys. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about how this is going to split, but – it, I, I only look at this from a non-fantasy point. I'm excited. I think DeAndre Swift probably is going to get more catches. It is going to is going to spread the, the uh, field out a little bit more for Detroit. But I'm also not as low on Carrion Johnson as most people are. I, I, I don't think that he's been given a legitimate opportunity with Matt Stafford out there the entire time and him being the main back. I think, you know, they had LeGarrette Blunt. That's how I picture now. So it's it's really is Johnson and Swift, and and I it's easy enough for me because I stay away from it anyway. But I, I I really do think you could if they're both there and you want one of them. It, for me, pick either one. That's fair, Houston. Do you have anything on these two guys? I've got DeAndre at getting about a thousand yard all purpose season with carry on somewhere around like 750 ish all purpose yards uh i'm just a little bit more bullish on deandre just because he's an sec guy yeah i mean i honestly think if we're talking committees this is going to be one of the bigger committees that we see as long as carry on can stay healthy um i think that's why they brought deandre swift in i don't really see deandre swift as a complete work horse back by any means and I think carry on when healthy has been productive and has shown good flashes, but he will have to stay healthy. It's been the last two years. It's been a gamble for fantasy owners, whether they should draft him at his ADP and every year it falls a little bit more. And maybe this year is a value. However, I'm like Zach, I'm not going to touch these guys because um, one, I think it's going to be a committee and two, and they play in the NFC North bears, Packers, Vikings all have pretty good run defenses and I don't want these guys splitting time like, six times and then six times a year they're going to play against pretty stout defenses, especially when they play my Chicago Bears. 
<laughs> that's fair. That's fair, Houston. Uh, let's move it's forward. A a a situation. It's a 1A, 1B, right? You don't have a 1-2. It's a 1A, 1B. It's like Seattle last year. Yeah. I can definitely see that, and that's probably where my projections are going to go with these guys. Uh, I want to move forward, though, Tom, and talk to you about these guys. This is probably my most confused backfield just because I'm so torn. I'm torn between the SEC and I'm torn between a Texas guy that I've shook, shook, I've shook his hand. I'm talking about the Baltimore Ravens and – Mark Ingram the second from the University of Alabama, Grow Crimson Tide SEC. Uh, it means more. And then J.K. Dobbins from LaGrange, Texas, who shakes hands like a man. Yes, sir, no, sir. He's gonna get the job done. He's gonna learn from Mark Ingram. I don't know where to put these splits. My projections with these guys, it's just so crazy because one day I'm like, no, Mark Ingram's gonna have more carries. No, J.K. is gonna have more. Blah, 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 blah. I think they're both going to have over a thousand yards combined, uh, just because the offense are in with Greg Roman. I mean, Greg Roman. Greg Roman has one of the run heaviest offenses in the league. They've also scored the most TDs per game in the league. Roman is a savant when it comes to running the ball, along with the head coach there, uh, Harbaugh, who knows how to use Lamar Jackson. And we're not even going to talk about Lamar Jackson. We're just going to talk about the running backs. And I don't know where to do either of these guys because I want to take as much shares. I want as much shares of this backfield as I can. Lamar, I'm sorry, Mark or JK. I mean, talk me through what you're thinking about. I mean, I'll tell you what, you're not wrong. This is a team that only had an actual quarterback in for seven games last year. RG3, right? The rest of it, you didn't have an actual quarterback. You had a Ryan back, so. Um, no, I mean, if you're going to take a running back, take, uh, take Lamar Jackson. But you know, these two guys are probably the closest you're going to get, I think, for ADP as far as like a single team goes. Um, what I'm showing was that uh, Mark Ingram, as far as RBs go, was at 26, uh, RB26. J.K. Dobbins at RB29. So I don't know about you guys, but tell me one that's a little closer than that. That's tight. There's not one. Um, so I think that this is one that's going to really fall to how the offense kind of plays throughout the year. It's, it's really going to be almost a game-by-game game and just scenario-based who's going to get the touches. Obviously, Mark Ingram is more of a power guy. He's just a big you know, running back that can run somebody over. Not that J.K. Dobbins couldn't, but he's definitely more of a, a, a lightweight compared to, to Mark Ingram. So personally – uh, if I really had to choose one and it's a flip of a coin, it's going to be J.K. Dobbins. I think he has a little bit better, uh, yeah, a little bit better uh, you know, receiving ability, which gives him an edge. Not that you have a quarterback to throw him the ball, but, uh, you know, hey, it's it, it definitely benefits you, especially in a PPR league. If you're going to get any receiving touches over somebody else, I think it's near 50-50 split for these guys otherwise. Ryan, I want to know what you think about these two guys because you're torn just like I am with these guys, I'm assuming. Yeah, the thing is, like, Dobbins is so talented, and Ingram's getting a little older, but he hasn't had the mileage that some of the guys his age have had. Um, and I, I think they really hurt each other as far as either one of them being an elite back. The other thing that you really got to think about is Gus Edwards and Justice Hill are no bums. Um, I, no way am I touching those guys compared to the other two, but they will take a bit of the touches away from those guys. Uh, like, I don't know how much longer Ingram can remain at the levels he was. I mean, I know Baltimore's offense overall is pretty efficient, but when you look at J.K. Dobbins is very good, and Ingram is not young. So it's, I think it's just a matter of time. Will it happen this year or will it be later on when Dobbins becomes the guy? I think we might be looking at another year with Ingram and Dobbins kind of splitting. But if, if you're in dynasty, there's there's a good argument to be made that Dobbins might be the most valuable of them because of the way that Baltimore runs over everyone. And uh, Dobbins is going to be the lead back sooner rather than later. It just might not be this year. I, I'm have, I have a hard time with those two guys too because, I mean, what Ingram did last year, he was excellent. And same for Dobbins in college. And so when you're looking at – they, they took a strength and made it stronger. Yeah. 
these are there's a lot of icky <laughs> backfield committees right now. It's not easy to figure out which guy is going to be the guy, especially without preseason and with everything that's going on. The coaches have, you know, I, I don't believe in that coach speak stuff. I don't believe the stuff they feed us because I don't think they're telling the truth. So it's going to be – I do like Dobbins. I'd like to get exposure to either one of these guys, but maybe not Ingram at where they have him going in a lot of places. But, I, man, I, I just, you just got to think that Dobbins, with the youth and with that offensive system, if he gets enough touches, he might just take it over, even if Ingram's efficient. Because why wouldn't you – I mean, are they going to pay Ingram at his age? Or I'm looking at him as like – we don't need Ingram now because we have Dobbins. And that's where it's going to go eventually. Again, it might be one year later than this year, so it's going to be hard to tell. <laughs> like Tom said, I'd rather have Lamar Jackson. He might have more rushing touchdowns than both those guys. I so don't disagree with you at all, Ryan. I mean, Ingram last year put up a 1,000 yards, but we've seen the kind of guy Ingram can be when he shows up at the plane and his – team is coming off that plane and he's right there waiting for them not playing with them uh he's he's just a hype man we've seen him talking about big trust all year last year maybe they don't pay him as much but he sticks around and just teaches jk because you gotta like a guy that's like jk who put up 1400 yards a thousand yards and then two thousand yards at the ohio state houston in the big 10 who we also know has stout run defenses. These guys run the ball, they stop the run. This is one of the hardest college conferences to run the ball against people, and J.K. Dobbins has done it. He's a guy that you've seen, and you just see him on film, and you're just like, he's faster than everybody else. He has that next-level speed. You saw that in col- or in high school to college. You see that in college to the pros. He just has to have an opportunity to get out there, and he's going to excel, I believe. I don't think anyone else thinks otherwise about that. Um, But let's move on, Houston, and let's talk about the Indianapolis Colts. This team right here is another one that's a toss-up, obviously, because we're talking about timeshares. But we've got a guy in Marlon Mack who put up 1,000 yards last year and was not a scrub. I mean, return of the Mack, if you would. I mean, was my song. Jonathan Taylor, though, from Wisconsin, another Big Ten guy, is no slouch. I mean, he put up another 2,000-yard season last year uh, like J.K. did. But back-to-back 2,000-yard seasons on on the ground, this dude can run the rock with probably the best offensive line in the league. Where do we find these splits coming out? Because you can't just bench a guy like Marlon Mack who put up a 1,000-yard season. Or can you? I mean, I wish they would. Um, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Taylor is going as the RB26 right now in the sixth, seventh round, which is just crazy. I've been – personally, I've been taking him in basketball, you know. As my third running back, I go three running backs right away and take Jonathan Taylor as my third. Uh, Martin Lamack goes as the RB32 in the eighth or ninth round, um, which – you know, that's only six spots difference there. But I really like Jonathan Taylor. And um, I'll talk about Nick Chubb in the Cleveland back in the Cleveland backfield in a little bit. But what's the difference between Jonathan Taylor and Nick Chubb? I mean, they're Jonathan Taylor, the, the only thing that's different between them is the ADP. Both powerful runners, both can run between the tackles. You're gonna get Chubb in the first round, Jonathan Taylor in the eight and the sixth or seventh. He's gonna I think he'll rise to the fourth or fifth by the time we get all said and done. But Jonathan Taylor's gonna run behind a better offensive line than Nick Chubb. I'm I I'm more scared of Kareem Hunt than Marlon Mack um any day of the week. You know, Marlon Mack ran for a thousand yards. That's because this is probably the best offensive line. Maybe you can say top three. I consider him the best offensive line in the league. And Philip Rivers' arm, it's getting worse. I, I'm not a big fan of Philip Rivers. Um, there might be other people around here that are, but if you watch the show consistently, I'm not a Rivers fan. I think you'll have to hand the ball off. It'll be interesting to see which running back will get the pass work out of the backfield, and people like to down on Jonathan Taylor that he can't catch out of the backfield. 
Well, we saw like I believe over thirty catches last year. Um, and he's he runs between the tackles twenty five. T- yeah, he runs between the tackles twenty five times a game at uh, Wisconsin. You know, you don't see running backs in the college game unless you're Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Get passing work. I mean, that's just not how college offenses work. So Jonathan Taylor is proficient as a uh, receiving back, so I don't like when people say that narrative against him. I'm all Jonathan Taylor here. I'm not going to touch Marlon Mack because, yeah, Marlon Mack might start week one, but I think Jonathan Taylor is going to claim this backfield by week two or three just because he's that talented. Jonathan Taylor is a real shock to be one of the best running backs in the league, give it a year or two. I like the guy. People want to talk about the mileage he has on him from playing at Wisconsin. But, you know, I'm not going to worry about that now. We'll see in a couple years. But I think he's really going to be good behind these young offensive linemen that Indianapolis has. I'll tell you what. I'm pretty sure that you could get a more effective throw in motion out of one of those gummy hands that you, like, fling at your friends back in, like, the 90s and 2000s than you can with Philip Rivers' arm. So I don't necessarily think you can go wrong with either of these guys behind that offensive line, not going to lie. It looks like a shot put. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it's, it's you know, you're talking about like the little 25, 50 cent little things that you like slap around? Yeah, yeah, the little like, Yeah, the little <laughs> arm. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, like from pizza, pizza or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're not wrong, Houston. I mean – Jonathan Taylor averaged over 300 yard, or 300 carries a season. So he's got some mileage on him, but, I mean, come on. This dude is an animal. I'm with you on this. I think Marlon Mack's going to fall. I think Jonathan Taylor's going to ascend in this offense as well. Uh, I think Philip Rivers is going to possibly make Nehemiah Hines a guy again. I got a very, very short story. I partied with uh, Monte Ball one time. and Monte Ball of the Denver Broncos? Literally, he told me he told me to draft him, and then he was an absolute bust. And I won't go after <laughs> bouncing running backs from now on. I literally, <laughs> dude, that's awesome. <laughs> Monte, my favorite man, show. <laughs> God, I hate, I hate him so much for that. <laughs> Tom, let's move on. Though we talked about the Buffalo Bills with our friend of the show, Michelle from Ball Blastum. And she told us to feature Zach Moss. It has been getting crazy with the Zach Moss love. I dug deep with this kid. And this kid is pretty amazing. Yet he played in the Pac-12. I mean, it's okay. He's still putting up numbers, though. With the coach that they have in Buffalo, he likes to be a little run heavy. Um, he's called over 60% of his plays run versus pass. Uh, but he's got a very volatile quarterback in Josh Allen. So we don't know what Josh Allen's going to do, right? He could just throw it to the other team like we saw with the Houston Texans. We'll move on from that because I know people are going to hate me for that. But we got Devin Singletary, who is an explosive kid, man. This dude... Oh. G- can make a touch like he can just take it to the house on any given play but then we also have zach moss who could quite possibly in my mind bring back the vulture scenario in fantasy football just because of his ability to run between the tackles i mean his three we're not going to count his freshman year but his last three years at utah state he had over a thousand yards one being close to 1500 and over 30 touchdowns on the ground. This dude is an animal. Uh, Michelle was not wrong about him. What are your feelings on the split between Singletary and Moss uh, using the ADPs at 25 and 43? Tell you what, I don't know if any of you guys have been to the Rockies, but if you have, you know you cannot breathe up there. There's zero air. So the fact that that guy was a monster with no air to breathe, I barely – I would walk 25 feet and I couldn't breathe, right? No, but on, on a real note, the guy is a monster, right? You look at PFF. PFF uh, had him second in run grade uh, – excuse me, run grade, second in broken tackles, right? 
the guy, it, it's not even just a between the tackles runner. He can get outside. He can do whatever you need to do. Honestly, I see him taking over. You know, I, I think that starting early in the season, you're going to see Singletary as the lead back, but I think it's going to quickly shift when they realize what a monster he is, right? Um, I think that Zach Moss at, uh, where, you said you had him at 43, right? I mean, that's a steal to me. Yep. You know, you might miss out, like, first couple of weeks, you might not have him as an RB1-2, might be a flex guy at best, but late season, he's an RB2 pushing into an RB1 to me easily. Um, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, Singletary is good, but I just think that it's you're going to – you're almost going to just forget about him entirely by week seven, eight, nine, unless there's an injury concern. I mean, Singletary did average 5.1 yards a carry last year. He's explosive. So, there's no doubt about yeah. that. But is he the workhorse? And that's where I just don't know that he is, and I think that that's where, you know, really where Zach Moss is going to come in. He's going to be able to take that ball, run it every down, do whatever you need him to do. Like I said, if he can run it up in Utah, he can run it in Buffalo. <laughs> He's going to be able to do anything you need. I don't doubt that at all. Um, Zach, let's move on to the Los Angeles Rams. Let's keep it moving, man. This is a team that, I mean, I've got a huge man crush on Sean McVay. I've had for a huge man crush on this dude since he entered the league with John Gruden back in the day when he was the piss boy. Uh, I'm talking about the LA Rams and his unique style of offense that has seen his running backs ranked in the top 10 guys year after year after year, even with some no-name guys like Malcolm Brown and Daryl Henderson Jr. This year they got a guy from FSU who the narrative for him is that they played, he played behind a bad offensive line. Same thing in the NFL. Obviously, the Rams aren't ranked up really high in their offensive line, but he could do some things behind that offensive line. I'm talking about Cam Akers, the se- or the seminal baby from the ACC. He has two thousand two one thousand yard seasons with over twenty one touchdowns in those two seasons. This dude, if you hand him the ball more than one hundred and fifty times, he's gonna get you. 4.7 yards per carry and close to a thousand yards. Then you got a guy like Daryl Henderson or Malcolm Brown. I, I categorize them both in the same right there next to Sean McVay. And we've seen them last year on TV. They were standing right next to him and he's not making eye contact with them. And he's like, y'all aren't going on the field. I have so much hope in Cam Akers. I might draft this guy as my running back too, uh, just because of the work that he could get. What are your feelings on the Cam Akers Henderson Jr. split? So I'm a little. I was actually really glad I got this team. I'm a little biased here because I obviously I live in Memphis. I'm a big Daryl Henderson guy. Watched every single one of his home games live, junior and senior year. Okay, so I got uh, I literally the most explosive guy I've ever watched live pre NFL. Okay. Daryl Henderson, I feel like, has not gotten a fair shot. I am very high on Henderson. I think if he gets a fair shot, he's he is a home run running back, I think. Whether or not he gets that shot is the big question mark in LA. You just mentioned Sean McVay is not making eye contact with him over there. We don't think he's going to get the ball. They, they, obviously, they're drafting Cam Akers for a reason. They've got Henderson and, and Brown in the backfield. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think Akers is going to get more of the workload. ADP-wise, he's 88. Henderson's over 100 at, like, 103. And he's even higher at, at PPR. So, um, obviously, people are a little higher on Akers right now. Uh, does come from FSU, whereas, you know, it's, it's obviously ACC, whereas uh, uh, Henderson comes from the AAC. In Memphis, he's not playing a stiff competition. So, he probably looks a little bit better in college, but – Still, I, I t- man, I got this vibe that like I think really, I really do think that Henderson like, like I've watched Anthony Miller, I've watched Tony Pollard, I've watched Paxton Lynch, and I've watched Daryl Henderson. These all these guys like, like Henderson is by far the most exciting and most explosive. I just wanted to get a chance. Fantasy wise, probably putting more faith in Acres right now because of like how you mentioned, you know, it just the Rams have just seemed to, ever since Ty Gurley just seem uncertain about their backfield. 
and here they are drafting acres so yeah there's a lot of potential upside for acres but i'm also still putting a lot of like i like henderson i'm picking him quite a bit i'm i don't know if it's a good move yet but now that the backfield is as open as it is in la this is henderson's shot and i would not be shocked whatsoever if he absolutely goes off Houston, why do you think that McVay doesn't unleash Henderson? Because he is an explosive guy. We've seen him be explosive, but they just don't unleash him. Do you think they're saving him because they just want to run Todd Gurley into the floor last year? Or what do you think? I mean, they didn't run Todd Gurley into the floor last year. The problem was, you know, McVay was non-committed to Todd Gurley which didn't make sense. He was their success. That's why they made the Super Bowl the year before was on the back of Todd Gurley. The offensive line was not very good, you know, bottom five in, uh, in 2019. And Henderson got really overdraft fantasy and fantasy wise uh, last year. He was going in like, you know, the sixth, seventh round in some leagues because People didn't believe in Todd Gurley. They thought one little tweak in Todd Gurley's knee would be hanging on the floor or something. But, no, I think Daryl Henderson has a good chance to compete for this starting job. Um, Cam Akers is a big elusive back, however, can break tackles. It'll be really interesting. You know, I thought I could uh, understand what Sean McVay was doing, but, you know, this guy's gone out and done things that I don't understand. Uh, One thing for sure I do think they'll lean a lot on 12 personnel to help that offensive line out, which means there's a good chance that we could see a little bit more running. You know, Jared Goff was second in the league last year in pass attempts. I don't think that's the same in 2020. I wish it was. I like Jared Goff, and I like the receiving options. But I think there's going to be a good committee. Well, one, I I don't know which one's going to take the starting role. But it'll be interesting. I think that this is a committee that I don't want to touch because I don't really know which one I would prefer. That's fair. Ryan, let me ask you this. Houston brought up a good point last year. Um, Daryl Henderson was getting drafted around the seventh round. Uh, This year they had him marketed around the 11th round. But from Scott Fishbowl that we've all seen, Daryl Henderson has dropped to the 14th round. Give me that. Give me the fourteenth round. You too. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not high. I'm more high in Acres. I am, but Zach, I agree with you, man. D- Henderson was an animal in college, and I don't know what happened. Um, so, uh, same with Trent Richardson, animal in college. Although he did have one good year, but what happened? Like, I will blame the line. It wasn't very good, and um, I'm not sure it's going to be very good this year. But see, Acres is used to that. So, and he's a much bigger back, much harder to bring down one, whereas Henderson kind of needs a little room to get going and to explode. Akers is going to grind out those harder yards. He's also going to be more useful in the red zone. Um, I, I just, if, if Henderson's going in the 14th round, I love that. I'll get some exposure to him there. But I'd rather have Akers, and I think that a lot of people are higher on him and his ADP is reflecting that, and it's going to be hard for me to get exposure to him based on that. But, uh, I, I mean – I don't touch Malcolm Brown. I, I just don't think between those three, Malcolm, unless they both get hurt. And even still, again, that line's not very good. So I, I'd rather have Akers, but Henderson in the 14th round sounds like a treat to me. Man, it sounds like we need a little prop on these guys between Henderson and uh, Brown and Akers. Speaking of props, though, Prop Me is a new innovative gaming platform and really first of its kind. PropMe makes betting from person to person easier than ever. Designed for new and experienced gamblers alike, guys. It's straightforward. It's fun. PropMe makes literally, or PropMe can literally create a prop or bet on anything. Want me to bet on the next play? How many beers I'm going to drink? How many times I'm going to say SEC? How many times we're going to backpedal? PropMe can do this, guys. Uh, Create a prop. It takes hanging out with your friends to the next level. Join today. Download PropMe at PropMeLLC.com. And also, follow our guy, David, David on Twitter, man. He is super cool, super fun. He's always posting new stuff on Twitter. 
Really nice guy. We love him, man. Thank you, David, for supporting us. Uh, Zach, let's move on, though, man. And I know you got some stuff to do tonight. Uh, let's talk about the L.A. Chargers. They had a guy in Austin Eckler who was a top seven, top four, something like that, back last year. And then a guy that had a Will Smith high top, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Justin Jackson, that I'm really high on. He finished at number 90 last year. I think he's going to have a bigger role this year and could quite possibly eat into the Austin Eckler role. Um, what do you think over there in L.A. across from the Rams? Uh, because I know how I feel about Justin Jackson. I love the kid. Well, I want to know what you think. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I got both LA teams. That makes me want. It just makes me want to move out there. Uh, <laughs> but here we are, Chargers. You guys know I'm high. On, we we talked about our running backs. I think I had Eckler six. Um, I I don't think we he cracked our top ten though consensus wise. So um, I was I was higher on Eckler than most were. And you know I really do think with uh, Philip Rivers gone and they got Tyrod Taylor and, and they drafted Herbert, it's a little unsure how the offense is going to run. Um, I think a lot of it. And I've said this before, the Chargers are going to go as Eckler goes. But but you're right. I mean, you said you're high on Justin uh, Jackson, Chris. I, I I think you got every reason to be. I mean, he only played seven games last year and uh, put up 200 yards. He put up 200 yards in his rookie year uh, playing at 13 games. So it only took him half as many games to, uh, to put up the production in his second year. And he's averaging – I mean, he's only got uh, right around 80 carries, but he's averaging about five yards a carry right now in the NFL, which is not – I mean, that's not easy. So – uh, I think you're right, and and when you've got caution with well, him, that, to, he did that without Pouncey at center too. Yeah, so I, I think you're right. I think he is going to take touches away from Eckler more still than I thought before. I, to be honest, before I researched for this episode, so uh, I think that I'm slowly getting a little lower on Eckler, maybe, but uh, I, I still I still think Eckler is a top ten running back, and and I think that they're going to. Uh, going to utilize him to win games or to try to win games. I, I The Chargers are one of those teams that I, I think could win 10 games, but could also win three games. They, it, it's, they're hard for me to understand. And, and if they win 10 games, I think Eckler's going to be lights out. And if they win three games, I don't want any piece of this backfield. I totally get that. I think my boy Tyrod Taylor, the cheat code, has got to have a big part of it, obviously. Uh, Anthony Lynn will – I don't want to talk to you right now, Ryan. Anthony Lynn and Tyron Taylor, they got this huge, you know, they've got all sorts of background together. I think Austin Eckler should do well. Um, I think Justin Jackson might get a lot of goal line carries or stuff like that. Um, Ryan, all right, I'm gonna, let's touch on it. What do you want to say about that? <laughs> Two things. One, Herbert's going to be playing by week seven. Two, don't sleep on Josh Kelly. Uh, that guy was a machine a consistent machine average over a touchdown a game in college i don't think he's yeah, gonna, right. i don't think he's going to surpass jackson or eckler but he is going to eat into the touches i think eckler is elite and i think jackson would be an option if kelly didn't play for them and because of kelly i do think that jackson's going to get more of his touches because eckler so much of what he does especially in ppr is receiving i mean the guy is a <laughs> he's a monster in as far as receiving goes and for Tyrod, that's going to be valuable. And then for Herbert starting off, having a running back that can do what Eckler does out of the backfield is special. It's just a safety blanket too. He is one of the best receiving backs in the league. And because of that, his floor is so high, no matter what quarterback is going to be there. Uh, Eckler's almost guaranteed RB1, almost just because of how many balls he's going to catch. I mean, he's, he's such a good receiving back. I, I like Jackson. I really do. But Kelly makes me freaked out about Jackson more than it does about Eckler. That's fair. I got to say, you nailed it there, Ryan. He's the second coming of Darren Sproles in L well, for the Chargers. He's a receiving back. I, I think that elite might be a bit of a stretch of ability wise, except for the fact that if you look at numbers wise, he's going to put up elite numbers. If that makes sense, he's kind of that Tom Brady guy. He, he's not necessarily the best running back, but he's going to succeed. He's going to have the stats. He's going to he's going to be able to succeed on the field. That's how I feel Just about Ceh this year. I think he's going to put up numbers, but I really don't think he's one of the best backs. 
And yeah. Exactly. I, he's and special, yeah. man. I mean, it's just being in that Andy Reid offense with Patrick Mahomes, your stock is going to rise no matter who you are. If they signed Ryan tomorrow, Ryan would be a guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> let's move on though to our guy dan mater our guy who is the head of our fancy department who works night and day promoting our stuff who has just came out with his own rankings and projections how all of us know how hard that is and he has done it for 32 teams every player standard ppr and half point Go check this out on our website. It's going to help you win. But, Ryan, let's talk about his team, the San Francisco 49ers. They've got a guy that wants to get traded out or get more money in Raheem Mostert, who had a good season last year. But then they also have the guy who doesn't say a lot, who Kyle Shanahan brought in, who has worked with before, and also behind the scenes, also is being paid a little bit more money than all the running backs. we got Raheem Mostert. We got Tevin Coleman. You know my affinity for Tevin Coleman. We have talked at length about my affinity for Tevin Coleman. I'm in like over 40-something leagues, excluding best ball. And I own Tevin Coleman in like, what, 12% of my leagues? That's a huge number. So I've got an affinity for this guy. I want Raheem Mozart to get up on out of there, and I want Tevin Coleman to get the guy because I'm picking this guy up in the 12th, 13th round. So I've got really high aspiration for Coleman, but he's already a good guy uh, in Kyle Shanahan's offense who any running back will see touches and points and touchdowns. And I can go on and on about Kyle Shanahan's offense in the running back by committee, but I want to know what you think about this because you already know what I think. Yeah, I wasn't so – I think I was the lowest on Coleman before the Mostert news. Real and- quick, though. With the whole most certain news, because I am bringing that up, he has not been traded. He's still on the team. He is still RB1 as of right now. So. Yeah, so let's, let's operate under the assumption that Mostert stays. Correct. Mostert's going to be the, the quota. He's going to get the most touches, just based off what he did at the end of the year. However, even when he was doing that, Coleman was getting his touches. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo is not that good in my opinion. Because of that, San Fran's defense is so good, and they're running back. I mean, they lost Brita, but I do think McKinnon's going to be healthy this year, and he can replicate some of that stuff. But I think more of those touches are going to go to Mostert and Coleman than they do to McKinnon. And the thing the thing is, like, this is so in flux because of the Mostert trade demand. So, honestly, Coleman is going to be skyrocketing up my lists now because of this scenario. Um, and even if Mostert stays – that's going to have to leave a sour taste in their mouth, and it would not shock me to now see Coleman become the, the lead in touches just because of the trade demand. Uh, so, you know, all you, most of you guys were Tevin Coleman truthers, and I was not about it, and I'm looking a little silly now based off of what Moster did. So I am reforming. I'm going to try to get up my exposure to Tevin Coleman because I think no matter what happens, he, he has a very good shot of being the guy with the most touches in that backfield. And that is a backfield you want exposure to if you know the guy that's going to get it. Again, everybody was really high on Mostert coming in. And now that Coleman really might be the guy because of this whole scenario, you, you got to love Coleman now. No matter what happens, Coleman is probably the back to own there now. And that that is an entire shift change for me from where I was just a few days ago. Just because, again, Coleman has been consistent. He's, he's a worker. He's a dual threat guy. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of weakness in his game. I didn't think he had a ton of strengths, but behind in that system, having no weaknesses is the strength you want to look for. And so because of his ability to catch the ball, because of his, I mean, he doesn't have to come out ever. He can do anything that they're going to need him to do. So I do expect to see Mostert sliding down the draft boards, and I expect to see Coleman and, by extension, McKinnon and maybe Jeff Wilson moving up slightly just to be that handcuffed guy. Because I'm not sure if they try to overuse Coleman, I'm not 100% certain he's going to be a 220, 230 uh, rush guy. I don't think that that's what his strength is. So somebody's going to have to get those RB2 touches, those RB3 touches, and they use three RBs. So, but right now, 
I never thought I'd say this, but I'd like to get Coleman more than any of the guys in that backfield, just based on the fact that Raheem Mostert is, I mean, he could hold out. There's a, there's a shot he could hold out. And I mean, I, I get it when you say players need to get their money and he's getting paid like a special teamer right now. And that's clearly not what he is. I don't, <laughs> this is a scary backfield for me just because of, I was high on Mostert and now I'm unsure, but Coleman has definitely moved up my rankings because of this because of the Raheem Mustard scenario. I totally agree with you, Tom. What so you I, I snagged when, when the, when the Mustard news came, came to light, I snagged McKinnon in our belly up uh, dynasty league. And, uh, but Super I know that quick. I saw that I went in there and I was like, Oh God, but then yeah. I realized I already had Tevin Coleman. So <laughs> I saw that you had Coleman. I, uh, but I don't know. I really, I'm curious what you guys like. I, I Ryan just touched on it. McKinnon's 28. They just restructured his contract. He's making, he went from making six and a half mil this year to making under a mil. I think it's like nine hundred some thousand. I, I, I mean, I picked him up because of what might happen with Mostert, but I, and Coleman's injury history, but I just I don't see how like unless they lower McKinnon's contract and then run him into the ground. Like I really I I picked up McKinnon. I I'm just curious what your guys' advice would be to other people who are looking to pick up McKinnon. Do it. You know, I just. My whole thing with McKinnon is just his injury history, like you said, and I'm just a little wary on him. Uh, if I'm going to take a flyer, I'm going to go with my Texas boy, Jamichael Jim- Hasty, baby, from Baylor. I think Jeff Wilson is going to be the guy over him just just because of – I mean, I see a lot of similarities. You got Ahmed, too, that's there. They got a lot of young running backs. But, again, Coleman is the big winner here. He is the big winner from this. I mean, I got two things on this. Number one, Chris, I'm surprised that you're so into Tevin Coleman, considering he's a Big Ten guy. I know <laughs> it's great. I, I I talked to Ryan. I was like, "How is this the one Wild. running back that I own so much of? Not even an SEC guy." Right. And number two, though, I mean, we were talking about McKinnon. I got him in RB eighty. Right? You have a solid chance that he goes undrafted. If he's undrafted, I'm not opposed to picking him up. Usually you got garbage picks your last one or two picks, or you know, once the draft ends, you realize who's left on on the uh, free agent wire there that you, nobody picked up. I'm definitely not opposed to having him on my team. He's not going to be a guy that I'm trying to rely on, but he's absolutely worth having on your bench if you can do it because if he's healthy, he's dangerous. He's real dangerous, especially – if Matt Bre- or excuse me, uh, not Matt Breda, um, Raheem Mostert, Raheem Mostert, uh, thank you. If Raheem no. Mostert, uh, either holds out, gets traded, whatever the, the situation might be, for sure. Yeah, I'll keep this quick, but uh, there's a real if there was a real concern about Raheem Mostert being traded, yes, I like Tevin Coleman, his stock goes up for me. Um, I honestly think the guy that would be next in line isn't a guy that's even on the roster currently. If Raheem Moster did get traded, I'm thinking that Devontae Freeman would come back and be in that uh, role with Shanahan there. Yeah, I don't like Devontae Freeman. I'm not saying this is going to be a big fantasy outburst here, but if if Moster gets traded, I could see Freeman joining the San Francisco 49ers. I know Dan would hate that. But uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about this headache of a backfield. I love that. That's but I heard he was asking for over six mil a year, and I'm not sure they're going to do that. I don't think they can do that. But wow, I didn't even think about that—a Coleman Freeman reunion. Yeah, interesting. Falcons baby, but on on a different coast. That would be pretty cool, Tom. Let's move on, though, to the Mile High City, baby, uh, or everything that's fun is legal, baby, in Denver. We got MG2, Melvin Gordon, who is probably one of the most dynamic backs in the league. And then we got a guy who's got a great story in Philip Lindsay, who's a hometown kid, played at UC Boulder, has won over the fans, had a 1,000-yard season for the team last year, and... When no one thought that he could do it, he did it. He muscled it in. They bring in a guy like Melvin Gordon who's got all this hype, all this glory from Wisconsin, and they say, okay, y'all are going to share the backfield this year. 
ADP right now has, I believe, Gordon at the 19th running back, and then Philip Lindsay is the 38th running back. Gordon last year only had 600 yards, and Philip Lindsay had a thousand. How do you think this is going to shake out in Denver with Drew Locke, with all these weapons that they have? I mean, is Gordon going to be the guy? Is Philip Lindsay going to be the guy? Where are you taking these guys? You know, I might be a little bit unpopular in this. I don't think Gordon's worth it at RB19 even. Um, yeah, high 20s. Oh, that's sure. that's I love Gordon. Yeah, I, I love Gordon. I love Lindsey. I think they're both great running backs. You know, both are thousand plus yard backs. I think last year for Gordon, it doesn't, it's not representative of what he's able to do. Um, obviously, you know, you had the holdout last year. Um, I believe from 2016 to 2018, he averaged nearly 1,500 yards per, uh, from scrimmage per year. I mean, it, it's tough to say that, uh, you know, one's really so much better than the other. Um, personally, I think that this is going to be an air it out offense this year, though. Um, I, I'm big on Drew Locke. I think K.J. Hamler is a huge addition. I think, um, uh, you know, obviously you, you bolstered the, the receiver room. You have Noah Fant at uh, tight end. I, I can see this being a team that airs it out a lot. And I think whichever one gets the majority of the – the receiving touches is probably going to edge it out. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably Lindsay. Uh, you guys tell me if you think I'm wrong, but um, you know, I, I don't see them having a massive running game this year. Personally, this is a complicated backfield. I agree because you have all those receiving weapons. Um, I'm looking at them splitting carries pretty evenly. And I'm looking at them sprinting. They're both decent receiving backs, too. That's the problem. Well, it's a flip of a coin. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have one of them, you got to hope the other one gets hurt or something because that is an elite situation to be in if they're not splitting carries. But the fact that they're splitting carries cuts their ceilings. I'm with you. I'm not sure I like him at RB19 either just because of Lindsey. And then I where I would love to get a hold of Lindsey, I'm, Gordon's going to eat into those touches. I'll tell you what, what though, at RB38, I might be in on Lindsay, depending on what I'm interested. Yeah. I, I, can, I can probably get with that, but it, even at that, I'm maybe an RB2. I, I don't want to rely on him as a guy that needs to produce week in and week out. He's a great – either one is a great flex option. I think that based on their uh, ADP, Lindsay's the guy to take. Yeah, I apologize to anybody who has Royce Freeman in Dynasty Leagues. That, that's got to hurt. <laughs> that does hurt a lot, man. I yeah. don't disagree with either of you. Houston, do you have anything to add about these guys? Because I'm pretty much on board with fading Melvin Gordon, even though I'm a Melvin Gordon truther, or I have been for a while. Philip Lindsay's just too much of an asset to that team. He's got too much of a narrative for the surrounding people in the Denver area. And, I mean, he played UC Boulder. Come on. He's going to get those touches. Yeah, and I I don't believe in the pass-heavy impact of all the weapons. Yeah, they have good weapons, but in Drew Locke's five games, four and one, he only, only had over 300 yards one time. I mean, they can be successful without having Drew Locke have to throw for 400 yards. They have a good defense with head coach Vic Fangio, former Chicago Bears defensive coordinator. Um, so I do think they want to run the ball and I really like Lindsay as a receiving threat in PPR. He might be, I see him as a value like Tree Cohen or uh, James White has been in the past because I do think that Drew Locke will swing it left, swing it right. And Lindsay's electric. I, I don't know if this is right, but I believe in the last two seasons, he's had over a thousand yards, all purpose yards. So with the ball in his hands, he's electric and uh, I like Melvin Gordon. I don't know why they brought him in. I thought Lindsey could be the workhorse in this backfield, but I mean, the whole, uh, since he was a Charger, maybe they wanted him on his side to play the Chargers twice a year. That was one of Gordon's reasons for going to Denver. Um, but Melvin Gordon, he's been a top ten, a top five fantasy back before. I mean, I don't think that's him in Denver. I mean, he goes around the range of Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. I'd probably – I'm taking Clyde over Gordon. But 
Yeah, this uh, backfield, I like Lindsay as a – if you're playing in full-point PPR leagues, I could I could totally see where Lindsay's a steal and he's a good value. I think sure. the team that if running back and receiver it scares me to really take anybody unless they start dropping just because I think they're going to spread the ball a lot. I mean, obviously, Noah Fant and Drew Locke, I think, like we're saying, I, I think Drew Locke's going to have a big year, even, you know, like you said. You might not have to light it up at 400 yards a game, but I think he's going to have a solid year. I think fans will have a decent one as well. But receiver and running back, I think it's going to be spread a lot. Yeah, I think. I like Sutton. Sutton. I totally agree with you. I think uh, Cortland Sutton, too, you know, talking about all the receivers, uh, you could probably just fade all those guys right, Ryan. But we're going to keep on moving, Houston. Let's talk about. (laughs) Let's talk about Houston's. Chicago Bears, man. Matt Nagy, he's got one of the highest running back ta- uh, target shares in the league, but he knows how to utilize his running backs. Um, yards per carry, yards per catch, yards per attempt. His running backs are in the top of the league in all sorts of categories for this. He knows how to utilize these guys. He knows how to run a defense. You got David Montgomery. You got Tariq Cohen. Last year – Monty finished at 25. Cohen finished at 37. Right now, ADP's got Monty at the running back 21 and then Cohen at the running back 42. That's a pretty big difference when last year they didn't see, I mean, I guess not that big of a deal in points. Houston, I know that you believe Monty can have an over 1,000-yard on the ground season. I don't see it uh, with Cohen there. Convince me otherwise, please, because I like him. I think he's a talent. Yeah, and you know this is good analysis for me because I don't miss a I don't miss a snap of Chicago Bears football. Some last season I probably should have down year, but um, you know David Montgomery out of Iowa State, he uh, elusive guy, highest one of the highest break tackles, elusive ratings, but we didn't see that last year. Um, he played behind in my opinion, one of the worst offensive lines in the league. Um, I'm not sure what PFF has him graded in that sense, but it was bad. I mean, we paid the two tackles a big extension or semi-big extension, and then they were terrible. I mean, I think I could have got a pass rush against them, and that's another reason why I don't think Trubisky did very well last year. Um, However, David Montgomery, he's a sure shot to get over 250 opportunities. Um, people like to call him David Opportunity, um, but uh, he's gonna get the work. Um, he's gonna finish as a top twenty back. I there's no doubt about that. He was one of the least efficient backs in 2019. I think his efficiency rating will go up. That's why we brought in Jimmy Graham. That's why we brought in Cole Komet. This offensive line isn't good enough not to play 12 personnel. I think Nagy Smart. I hope that as a Bears fan that he will realize his faults. Maybe having eight tight ends on the roster is a good reason why. Brought in Demetrius Harris as well. He's a good run-blocking tight end. Um, Tariq Cohen, that's where the real value is. And this, uh, the thing is, Tariq Cohen could be a really good running back in this league, uh, as Austin, Austin Eckler like, James White like. But for some reason, they call him the human joystick, and it pisses me off when he runs 15 yards back just to gain, you know, it. If you ever watch a Bears game, watch Tariq Cohen. That's all he ever does. But if Tariq Cohen could figure out how to run forward, he could be really good. Um, in 2018, I believe Tariq Cohen finishes a top 10 fantasy back in half-point PPR leagues. Um, that's pretty good for a guy that's going to have an ADP of the RB40 or more. You know, people are taking Darius Geis over Tariq Cohen in half-point, full-point PPR. PPR leagues. I'm gonna take Cohen every day of the week, um, and that's just not a that's not just a fandom. He's gonna get the passing work. Uh, Nagy wants to use him. That's Nagy's offense. You know, he's gonna use him out of the backfield. And Tariq Cohen, he's probably our third best wide receiver, or you know, second best, third best wide receiver behind behind Allen Robinson and Anthony Miller. He's gonna be using the slot. You're gonna see David Montgomery and Tariq Cohen both on the field at the same time a lot. Um, You know, I'm currently both in on these guys at their ADP. Um, 
Monty because he's going to get 250 opportunities and Tariq Cohen because he's going to see work regardless of where he lines up on the field. And he's shown that he could be a fantasy relevant back when you're getting rewarded points per reception. That's fair. I wanted to know what your insight was to these guys because I knew that you were going to give us the best analysis of your home team. Can't disagree with anything that you just said. So, Ryan, let's talk about the Miami Dolphins. They've got a new quarterback and an old quarterback. I mean, they've got a whole shiny new offense, whole shiny new defense, but they bring in two veterans uh, for their running back situation and their running back by committee. They got Jordan Howard, who was a former Chicago Bear, and then they got Matt Breida, a former 49ers uh, running back, who both of these guys have thrived in their own offenses. With Chan Gailey, though, as their offensive coordinator, we've seen some things that are a little bit different. Um, him and Fitzmagic have this huge bond together where they know each other, and they've run four wide receiver sets in the past for the Jets. That being said, Gailey's, wide, or Gailey's running backs have all been in the top 12 with these offenses. So Jordan Howard, Matt Breida, I see these guys as two different types of backs. One guy who's a big bruiser like Jordan Howard, and then another guy who's a little bit more elusive, a little bit more versatile, and Matt Breida. But I don't want to have Matt Breida running in between the tackles, so I need both of these guys. Um, ADP has them pretty close as the running back 34 and the running back 41 from Fantasy Pros. Um, I feel like Jordan Howard is probably going to have a better year just because of the work that they're going to get in the red zone if they get there with Fitzmagic. Uh, I downgrade both these guys with Tua, and that's just me. What are your thoughts? Because I know we talked about this this week. I like I like both of these running backs. Um, Howard never gets the credit he deserves for just being a dog. He just – I mean, that guy hits the hole hard. So I'm a little higher on Howard just because he's going to get those goal line touches. Um, I mean, he has in the past. And Breed is going to be – it's going to be a lightning and thunder type situation. Breed is going to be – utilized probably a little bit more in the passing game, but I don't think a lot more. And the same thing, I don't think Howard's going to be utilized a lot more in the run game, just enough to where I do think Howard's going to be uh, a little more valuable, maybe touchdown dependent wise. Uh, and he's going to get those hard, tough grind yards, whereas Breed is going to be a big play waiting to happen. Uh, I actually want exposure to both of these guys because I think that their ADP is not accurate. They're going to do better than where they're being drafted. I think both of them are. I'd rather get a hold of Howard, especially in non-PPR leagues. Uh, in PPR leagues, I'm going to lean slightly more towards Breida, although I'll probably still take Howard because, again, the goal line carries are his. And so if you're in a touchdown-dependent league, Howard is who you want to get after. I mean, the guy has averaged – I mean, the guy's had six, nine, nine, and then six touchdowns. Last year, at splitting it with Sanders, he had six touchdowns. He has a nose for the end zone. He – is up until last year, he's basically flirting with or going above a thousand yards every year. He's getting in the tough way. He's not that old. I mean, he's 26 this year. And Brita has very little mileage for his, I mean, he's not old either. And he hasn't been the feature back. So neither one of, I mean, Howard, you got to worry a little bit more about with the mileage that he's had, but he hasn't really shown me much where I'm concerned about an injury history or anything like that. Uh, Brita, God, he's just so fast. So, with these two backs, I like this backfield. I would like to get exposure. In a lot of the same ways you were talking about Chicago, Houston, I would like to get exposure to both these guys based on their ADP because I think there's value to be had in both of them. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Tom, you know, what do you have on these guys? Howard is an enigma to me, right? I mean, he came to the Eagles last year. I was super excited as an Eagles fan. Obviously, Miles Sanders, we were – excited going into the year but we weren't expecting anything outrageous from him i think he really surprised a lot of people howard though i mean after his first two years in chicago like you said i mean he had 1300 years his rookie or excuse me 1300 yards his rookie year uh, just rushing 1100 his second year uh, along with okay receiving numbers it was 300 uh rookie year and over 100 uh, both years after but he just dropped off and I'm not quite sure what the deal was. And last year, I don't know if it was injuries holding him out or what it was, but late in the season, he just wasn't seeing the field. 
um, you know, they really were not clear on if he was actually hurt or not. And it kind of makes me a little wary going into this year. Was there something lingering that maybe he sealed up completely? Maybe it was just something that wasn't really announced to anybody. Um, and, it, and it just raises a question mark to me. Um, if he's fully healthy, though, Howard, by all means, I, I have no issue taking. I think that in the right offense, and if he's actually getting hand of the ball, he's a thousand plus yard rusher. Ryan, like you said, he can he hits the hole. He will run somebody over and keep going. So he's going to get the touchdowns. He's the guy if, if I had to pick. Yeah, and I think a lot of that had, last year had to do with Miles Sanders. I, I, I do think that, that does make me wonder, though, if he was hurt or not. But, I mean, yeah. he had to be beating. When they were just down to nothing, it was, it was weird. I'm not, you know, maybe it was just Sanders or – Maybe it was something else, but you know, you had him, you know, you had Sanders, you had Boston Scott and a bunch of practice squad guys. And it, yeah. it would have made sense to be able to throw Scott and uh, Sanders out at wide receiver in the slot or something if you had Howard available, but they just didn't do it. Yeah, yeah I like Howard a lot, man, compared to the other, compared to the other options back there uh, in Breida and then I guess Patrick Laird as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's keep it moving forward, though. And a big team. I mean, we're going to end this show with two huge teams. One being Kevin Stefanski's Cleveland Browns that Houston is going to talk about with a, an SEC guy from the University of Georgia. Go dogs, Nick Chubb. And then another guy, Kareem Hunt, who some say has not had a fair shake in the NFL because of his own personal things, and I could not agree with more. I mean, Stavansky called 19 games with Minnesota, and we saw what he did in that run-heavy offense, guys. He made one guy the guy to own, you know? He does have other aspects of his game where he's using 12 and 13 and 21 personnel, but not as much as his 11 personnel. Um, his tight ends are getting a, a lot of divided passes, but he's featuring one guy. The way that we think everything could happen is he could feature Nick Chubb and just have this guy be the most outrageous running back in the league because we saw him last year. And go close to 1,500 yards on less than 300 carries. So that's crazy, to say the least. Now, when Kareem Hunt was eligible to play, he did eat into Nick Chubb's target share, run share, everything all around. Just because Kareem Hunt from PFF is the number four guy in elusiveness uh, as a running back. So we would figure that Stefanski features Hunt a little bit. Houston, I know you're big on Nick Chubb. I know you're big on Kareem Hunt. I know you're big on this offense. At their current ADPs at running back, I think seven, and then I'm missing on Kareem Hunt somewhere at 30. How do you value these guys? I know that a lot of people are already going to say, I'm taking Nick Chubb in the first round if I'm in the later rounds. I'm probably there with you. I know Ryan's probably there. I know Tom is as well, judging by his head shakes, just because the opportunity this guy has, opportunity this guy has. But what are your thoughts with your analysis that you've dug deep in these guys? Have? Yeah, I mean, Cleveland went out and got Kevin Stefanski, brought that up uh, as their head coach. I really like that hire. Uh, St St Stefanski led Minnesota to top three rushing attack. And he went out, got two uh, tackles in Jack Conklin and Jedrick Wills. And then they brought in Austin Hooper, brought in a good run-blocking fullback in Andy Janovich. They want to run the ball. That's Stefanski's plan. Get the ball out of Baker's hands. You know, Baker might only see 15, 20 attempts a game, and that's how they're going to win games. You know, and that's how they're going to have to. I truly believe that. Um, you know, Cream Hunt, he, this is his last year in Cleveland. That's – just how it's going to be. He's either, they, he's either going to come out really hot and Cleveland's going to have to trade him or they're just going to let him walk and get nothing. 
terrible. I mean, if they really think that Kareem Hunt is the future of this team, they need to rethink it. I mean, Nick Chubb has been a beast ever since he set set foot on the field, and that's how it's going to be continued. Um, I love Nick Chubb. Uh, he's going to be a first-round uh, pick for me in most times, but you don't need to take him in the first round. People don't want Nick Chubb, and I don't understand why. Second in the league last year in rushing. You can honestly – You know, I'm in the Ryder Bowl, and I would not be surprised to see Nick Chubb fall to the mid-second, even late second. Um, And I will take that. I might even try to trade up and get him there. Um, Like I said earlier, when I compared him to Jonathan Taylor, both running backs in good situations, just ADP difference. That's why I lean Jonathan Taylor a little bit. Um, However, I like Hunt, but people say he's going to get all this passing work and all that that he's going to line up in the slot. Uh, Stefanski last year played a lot of, you know, uh, 11 personnel. He had a fullback in there. He had a tight end in there and he he had two outside wide receivers. Now who's there's no slot receiver in this form in this formation here. And it's not going to be hunt. I mean, Jarvis Landry dominated out of the slot last year. Jarvis Landry is the slot guy for the Cleveland Browns. Um, You know, I, a lot last year they did like some wishbone stuff. They put Cream Hunt at the fullback. They're one gonna they're gonna try to want to get Cream Hunt on the field. I think Freddie Kitchens had a lot bigger cr- crush on Hunt than Stefanski will. I think you know Chubb is Dalvin Cook like Hunt. I just don't see him on this team when it it really counts in the fantasy playoffs. It's gonna be all Chubb. You know uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Hunt maybe get traded to the like the Niners or something like that teams that might go out and trade for a guy. Cause he's going to walk. He's going to want a big deal because he's going to be somewhat successful. However, the character concerns and all that stuff, I'm, I'm all out um, another running with the law, another mistake. And he's off my boards. He's already off my boards. I'm, I don't have hunt in any dynasty. I just, he's elusive and he did well in Kansas city, but we saw Damian Williams do well in Kansas city. So, you know, we talk about all the time when you play with Mahomes, it's going to increase your stock. Was that Cream Hunt like as well? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see when Cream Hunt get, gets a full workload in 16 games again. But I'm currently not going to touch Hunt. He's RB 27. I, it's not worth it to me. There's just other guys in that range that I read. Not other running backs I'd rather take. The wide receivers and other positions that I'd rather take where he's getting drafted. Cowboys will take three Got yeah, character. Yeah, oh my god. They'll have to play D line for him though. That, that's Jim <laughs> Jim's specialty. <laughs> excluding I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a little bit, but excluding Kareem Hunt's character flaws has as every NFL player has. I mean, we're gonna categorize Kareem Hunt like this. Might as well say Joe Mixon as well. Same thing. Same thing. People not are taking the same, thing. The same thing. He not punched the same thing. Of McDonald's. She called him the N word. We don't know what happened. We, you can't. Well, we do know what happened with Hunt. He kicked a woman when she was on the ground. Said, we're not going to talk about this, Ryan. We're, oh, gonna, we're not going to talk about. You don't know what was said. I'm just fair. saying. No one knows what was said. That's fair. That is a fair can point. We, can we just insert the letter Kenny meme? Just. Allegedly. No, we can't because I know what that is, Tom. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> so we're we're, we're going to just take out character flaws all day, every day. I'm still not taking Hunt at that. That. Oh high no, level. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you because, like Houston was saying, I think he was like what RB thirty something like that. I'm looking at other positions at that point as well, unless I'm going zero running back, uh, which I very rarely do. Um, so maybe I'm fading Hunt all day, every day. I just in, think that at RB30, you have J.K. Dobbins, you have Sonny Michelle, Darius Geese, James Connors at RB28, Le'Veon Bell at RB27. There's so many guys I'm taking right away. David around. Johnson's in that area. I'm taking – Yeah, if I'm going RB even, it's, it's not him. Yeah. So regardless, yeah, I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, we've just seen Kareem Hunt's stats as he's come in with Stefanski la- – or I'm sorry – with Freddie Kitchens last year, the only stat I have that could possibly say something where you could 
have Kareem Hunt a little bit higher. If you look at Stefanski and you look at Kitchens' percentages, we're talking about per plays, excluding overtime per game. Kitchens is at 60.6. Stefanski is at 60.1. If you're looking at run versus pass, Stefanski is at 52%. Kitchens is at 51. If we're looking at pass versus run when the score is within three points, Stefanski, 62%. Kitchens, Freddie, uh, I'm sorry, Freddie, 66%. Run versus pass when you're trailing, Stefanski, 21. Kitchens, 50. So that's a big difference right there. But then if you're looking in the red zone, pass versus run, we're looking at a 40% versus 50% difference. And then when you're looking at everything else, they're talking about like a 5 or 6% difference. So both these coaches have a pretty similar coaching background when you're looking at their percentages overall in the different situations. So that being said, I'm going to have to agree with Houston. I'm going to take Nick Chubb over Kareem Hunt in a lot of these situations that I'm going to be put in this year. Uh, moving forward, though, because we're already at an hour 40 minutes. Ryan, I'm sorry, Houston. No, Ryan. Let's finish it off with my New England Patriots, with Cam Newton, James White, Sony Michelle from the University of Georgia, Nick Chubb's homeboy, go dogs. They split the backfield. I mean, these guys are ridiculous. We really don't know what Bill Belichick's going to do this season. Is he going to come out, as Mike Clay has suggested, in a new 2.0 wishbone situation and have all sorts of backs in the backfield? I mean, James White has been labeled the PPR monster. He finished at number 22 last year. Sonny Michelle finished at 28. He had a little bit of injury, and he has been ranked as the 31st running back, as James White being the 40th guy in a half-point PPR league. I feel like James White will outscore Sonny Michelle at the end of the year, um, being in one of the most pass-heaviest offenses, also being in an offense that has the most snaps per game, and then also being a fancy friendly offense from Josh McDaniels, who has the most fancy points scored per game. How do you feel about this timeshare between these two guys? Because both these guys, however you look at it, could be gold for your fancy football team. It's James White, baby. With the addition of Cam Newton, if you look at the numbers McCaffrey had uh, receiving wise, I have White catch uh, with 90 targets this year. He is going to be their second best receiver. He, if you're in PPR, it's James White all day. If you're in standard, then I have them ranked pretty evenly. I do think Michelle's going to get the lion's share of the carries, uh, and he's going to be the, the goal line back that gets the runs. But James White's going to catch so many balls in that system. that I, I just don't think Cam is a great down-the-field type of thrower. James White is going to be undervalued with his ADP. I want James White. Give me as much of that as I can get. I'll take Michelle at the right price. I think he's a little bit – I don't like the fact that he's ranked over uh, White. White is going to catch so many balls. So if you're in standard, I understand taking Michelle first because, again, he's going to get the red zone carries. He's going to get higher rushing yards. He's going to get more rushing attempts. But when you consider the passing game and then if you look at what Cam has done, he he's, he's – I, I don't mean to say he's like a check down artist, but tight ends and running backs are tends to be where he sends his targets – for the most part, God, James White is perfectly built for a system like this with Cam, with the threat of the run, to be able to hop out, catch the little short passes, and see what he can do with it. I like James White this year. I've nothing against Michelle, uh, but it's James White is so criminally undervalued at the moment when you talk about with the addition of Cam Newton. I mean, even if Stidham, say Cam gets hurt before the season, Stidham's going to need that check down running back. I think either way, the more I think about it, the more I want – I'm going to try to up my exposure to James White based on where people are valuing him right now just because, man, that guy's going to catch so many balls. He's going to be a dominant receiving presence uh, in the vein of like an Eckler uh, – not quite Eckler, but in that same vein where he's going to get so many targets. It's going to be hard to ignore him. I think that this is crazy how undervalued he's going to be. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a New England offense – and you see Cam and you see Sony, I'm putting nine dudes in the box. If right. I see Cam and I see James White, I'm having my flex guys out there. I'm having my cornerbacks out there just to 
tackle this guy in the open field. I know my defensive ends aren't going to do this. Tom, growing up in the Carolinas, man, you saw Cam Newton play for these guys. You know what he can do. Not much. <laughs> I mean, you have to be a little bit excited about him in New England. I no. think you, know, you can't be that excited. Not at all. <laughs> not excited. I don't think Cam, Cam's great. I think he's okay, but you know, he's not going to lose you a game. I'll tell you what, the big thing, I think Ryan nailed it, though. He's a check down guy. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either, but when he was in Carolina, you know, especially the last couple of years, CMC at running back got a million targets and Greg Olson at tight end. When he didn't have Greg Olson at tight end, they struggled. Even with DJ Moore at receiver, who personally I think is very undervalued. He's a very, very good receiver. He still couldn't do it. He, um, again, I think we've had the conversation a few times and I think we've absolutely annihilated this guy for it, but he doesn't have a noodle arm like Phillip Rivers, but uh, it's definitely not a rock. He's not Jameis Winston being able to chuck it downfield. It's he's going to chuck it, or excuse me, he's going to chuck it down to his receivers and running backs. And they don't have a great tight end in, or excuse me, his tight ends and running backs. He doesn't have a great tight end in New England. So James White, I think Ryan nailed it, is going to be the guy to get checkdowns from Cam Newton. Yeah, you got to get excited about it. That's fair. Scott, I am a big Georgia fan because they're part of the SEC, and the SEC just means more. Um, thank you for all of our live comments. Everyone who's out there watching us, taking the time, spending an hour and 46 minutes with us, and just you know being there as we grow. Um, I cannot express the uh, appreciation. Yeah, the pre- there we go. Thank you, Tom. The appreciation I have for everyone that does that and is in the Twitterverse that has followed us from the beginning, all of our friends and family that just let us do this. I mean, me and Ryan know for sure our wives are like, your your podcast takes more precedence than us, but we, we <laughs> don't know they don't. Uh, but they can seem to think they do. Guys, let's end this off on a great note, man. I mean, I cannot wait to see y'all, at least some of y'all tomorrow. Tom, I don't know if you're going to do this with us. But Houston, let everyone know what we're doing tomorrow um, during our live mock and where they can follow you, everything you're working on. Also, that great new polo that you're wearing. Yeah. So, man. Uh, um, always look out for uh, what on the Belly Up Fantasy Facebook or Twitter every Saturday. Uh, pretty standard around 4.15 Central Time. Um, you know, we have a mock draft. Uh, going back and forth with the crew, always have a guest on, you know, last or yeah, two weeks ago we had Zach Mack. This week we're doing a Ryder Bowl mock. If you haven't heard of the Ryder Bowl, it's a dynasty league with uh, so many teams in the U.S. and so many teams in the EU competing for the top spot. Um, you know, one of those belly up guys are going to bring it back. I'll tell you that right now. But uh, always, always come on, either watch on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to have you. If you're looking to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Belly of Houston. Thanks again for the support. It's always nice coming on Friday nights and talking fantasy football with the crew. Absolutely. Um, uh, guys, just a quick reminder. I know it's scrolling at the bottom, but we have the St. Jude Belly Up Bowl going. Signups are open right now. Get in while you still can. We still have some openings. We got plenty of openings, but get in while you still can because this thing is going to fill. Again, a thousand dollars goes to St. Jude, a thousand dollars to the winner, twenty bucks to buy in. You're going to be doing a good thing for kids with cancer, and you can prove that you know what you're talking about, which probably isn't going to happen because I'm probably going to win it. But you're more than welcome to come try and compete. Come play with the let's do this guys let's see how good you are this is a chance to prove it against 119 other people so get in there while you still can uh people are signing up uh we want you guys the people who are listening to us in there we're we, y'all were in our minds when we decided to set it up let's do something for our listeners the people who read our stuff the people who follow us this is a unique opportunity to get in there you can use all the information we're giving you and see if it see if you can beat us see if you can take our information and make it better and beat us Love it. Love it. Tom? You know, Ryan seems to think he's going to take the money, but I'm taking all the money except for that donation to St. Jude's. <laughs> not taking that. But taking the rest of the money. But no, I mean, follow me at Belly Up Tom. 
uh, come tell me about how my takes are hot garbage. I can't wait. I'll, I'll fight you all day long on it. But no, I mean, I think these hot takes are going to win me that belly up bowl, Ryan. I can't wait to find out. Me neither, man. I'm excited. I see Scott thinks uh, Scott's going to join next week. I appreciate that, Scott. Thank you so much. He's got his own hot takes. Hot takes is what kind of gets you into that upper echelon, though, Tom. Uh, we're doing a couple things behind the scenes right now that everyone uh, can know about. One, Houston, Ryan have brought it to our attention that all of our rankers need to go onto fantasy pros and become uh, experts on there and see where we rank out because depending on where we think our guys are going to finish, fantasy pros will rank us out and tell us in accuracy how it works out. Uh, Houston has a, a, a man crush on a guy like how I've got a man crush on Bobby Sylvester who will join us. Uh, Kyle Yates. Kyle Yates came out today and said he finished in the 53rd place last year, and he's taking it into the top 20 this year. I think Houston is going to beat Kyle Yates this year. I'm going to challenge Kyle Yates at Kyle Yates NFL. I believe that's his Twitter handle. Houston, my boy, is going to take you down to the this, this year, sir. Belly Up is going to be in there, and we're going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, we've got a lot of friends of the show I want to thank everyone who's came on prior to Cliff Hogg, including Michelle and Gabby and Mike Clay. Uh, in the future, we will have Marcus Grant next week. After that, we're going to have my guy Greg Sussman of Sports Grid, who has shown me a lot in this whole community. And then we're going to close out our guests with Bobby Sylvester of Fantasy Pros, who I'm going to be an absolute fanboy for. I'm probably going to have to black out my screen when he's on there and mute my camera or mute my mic just because I'm going to agree with everything he says. <laughs> like Houston and Ryan have said, please join us with the first annual St. Jude's Belly Up Bowl. Our guys behind the scenes have worked so hard in putting this together and coordinating this with our guys and St. Jude to make this one of one of the biggest events that I've been a part of um, in the fantasy football world because how many times can you say that you've beaten 120 people and made a grand? Not a lot for 20 bucks. Let's do this, guys. Let's donate to a good cause and show everyone that you're the best. Tonight, I want to thank Cliff Hogg from, Bl from Big Brother from showing up, talking to us a little bit about his fantasy football uh, history, and then also Big Brother history, learning how to pivot because, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, the guy was voted out day one. He made it into the top four. You can always pivot, and that's what we're going to help you do. You can follow me at Aggie Kappa Sig on Twitter. I'm always on there. You can follow us at, uh, at Belly Up Fantasy. Guys, it was a great night tonight. I really appreciate y'all being here talking about these timeshares. Next week, we're going to talk about some wide receivers that Houston mentioned, but we're not going to dive into that too much. Follow us also on Saturdays as we jump into some Ryder Bowl mock drafts. And everyone who's watching, follow up, follow us on Belly Up Sports. Um, again, you can follow me at Aggie Kappa Sig. Thank you so much for watching us and interacting with us we really appreciate y'all and we hope to grow in the fantasy community guys this was belly up fantasy live y'all have a great weekend